This is the Garden of English. I'm Tim Freitas, and today we brought on a guest to help us actually access poetry. So if you're looking for ways to actually get into the poem and know what's going on, or to help teach your kids how to do it, then you're going to want to stay tuned. All right, we are here, and I have a super special guest here on the Garden of English today as we work on looking at ways to approach poetry uh, with our students. And uh, Gina, I'm so glad, glad that you're here, thankful that you're here. And before we get into poetry and talking about Ozymandias, why don't you tell us about yourself? Okay, thank you for having me. My name is Gina Cordum. I run the website AP Lit and More, which also has a Teachers Pay Teachers store. I've been teaching for 15 years. I've been teaching AP Lit for 15 years. Um, I also teach some sophomore English, Shakespeare, Brit Lit journalism, and a slew of other electives. And when I'm not teaching or running all the other things, I am a mom to uh, three young children. So that's pretty much it. Sounds a little bit chaotic. I know a little bit of what that's like as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I love your website. I think you've got amazing resources here. Um, and this is your teacher pay teacher store. And uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about ways to help kids access poetry. Um, and before we do, um, I just want to know, like, what are the struggles that your kids have in the classroom with accessing poetry? Um, and then I'll talk about mine and then we'll actually get into ways to do it. Sure. Um, so I see this from down to my sophomores and, and younger even, and then all the way up through my AP level, this feeling where they give up really easily. Um, I think that it comes from being taught poetry too often, like it's a riddle and it's just one answer that you're supposed to find out. And so they don't feel like they can make a valid interpretation. And I hear them give up or say it's too hard or try to look up an answer. And I would rather hear their interpretations and hear them kind of struggle with it more. And so I'm just trying to help give them a process so that they don't give up and they know kind of what's the next step so they can dig deeper and deeper into a poem. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's really important that, you know, we teach kids not to give up with poetry because it can be so beautiful mm -hmm. um, and uh, so moving. And a lot of times they're just like, it's a poem. I, I've got nothing. Uh, when I teach AP Lang, that's kind of like what kids are like with archaic language. They're like, it's archaic language. I've got nothing. Yeah. Um, and it's like, okay, how do we get strategies there? Um, you know, for me, when, when my kids accessing poetry, a lot of times I struggle with them not jumping straight to the abstract. So my students are like, oh, we want to talk about all these abstractions. And I'm like, no, you got to know what's actually going on. Because before we can get to the abstract, we got to get to the concrete first so that we know that our interpretation will actually make sense. Right. Uh, just because the word death is in the poem doesn't mean that the poem's all about death or, you know, something along those lines. So right. um, anyway, what we're going to do today is we are going to work with the poem uh, Ozymandias. And um, we'll, I'll read that up first. I'll read that first here. Um, and then what we'll do is I'll let you go through, hey, how do we uh, typically access the poem in your classroom? And then I'll talk about ways that I do it in my classroom. And then uh, you could all note that um, Gina d is going to use a um, infographic while we go over things. And that is for uh, posted for free on her Teachers Pay Teachers site. And I will have um, my steps posted, uh, linked right down below in the description. And actually, I'll put a link to your Teacher Pay Teacher site for that right. link in the description as well. Okay, right. so here's our poem. This poem, just so you all know, actually comes from uh, a set of prompts that I've made for Ozymandias. And there are actually two versions of it. Um, but I, we're going to use the more popular one by Percy Shelley. Uh, so here we go. It says, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them, on the sand. Half sunk a shattered vision lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passioned red, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, 
ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of the colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. All right, so there's our poem. It's super popular. Mm -hmm. And how do we access it here in your classroom? So what my students tend to do is they gravitate more towards poetry that's story-driven. So if you uh, look to the infographic, I don't know if you're able to pull that up for me, just yeah. a tad bit. Um, so the first thing that I did, I kind of did these in a de-escalating order. Um, but I wrote the first thing, like, what's what's happening? Okay, so my question is just trying to find the plot or the story. This worked really well when, it, when there's any kind of a narrative behind the poem. So if I were looking at Ozymandias, I would just say, well, there's a speaker. And he met a traveler, and the traveler tells us of Ozymandias. Uh, we learn about this ruined statue that is in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then obviously, we've talked about this, that um, when you do a little bit of research on Ozymandias, you learn that that's Ramses II, um, most likely the pharaoh from the Exodus story. Uh, so you have a little bit of an illusion there. And I would say that's the basic plot of the poem. It's... Yeah. It's not super complicated plot wise. Um, so then if you go over to the next side, what's really happening? This is where you start to separate what's a story versus what's a poem, because poems a lot of times have figurative elements. So um, this one doesn't have a whole lot of figurative stuff on the surface, at least. Uh, I said that this traveler, I met a traveler in an antique land. There's a, there's a chance that that's maybe figurative or symbolic in some sense. Uh, the statue takes on a bit of a figurative or maybe symbolic meaning, uh, right. but we're going to dig into that. Yeah. I was just thinking about that, the the word antique. I'm hoping that my kids might grab onto that and be like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, that's going to be my indicator that the antique land, like where is where is the first onsets of civilization, that kind of Mesopotamian kind of yeah. uh, location? And, you know, how does that word antique function? But you're right. I mean, this is a pretty straightforward poem. Uh, and that's why it's a good one to actually introduce with so that kids don't just go crazy with whatever the interpretation right. might be. Right. Um, and that falls a little bit later. You, I think I have like word choice or diction yeah. and antique is a really great one to do just a diction study when antique is less accurate. So why choose the word antique? That's right. an interesting an interesting word to talk about. Um, another thing that those who struggle with poetry, they do seem to usually understand tone and they understand imagery. Um, so I felt like that was a pretty, pretty logical next step if we want to start to venture into some poetic elements. So for imagery, it relies mostly on visual imagery. We have a lot of description of how the statue looks. I loved the description of boundless and bare of, of all the atmosphere around it being totally empty. And then with tone, there's a lot of words you could use. Uh, I always tell my students, you can't say happy or sad. Um, you have to do better than that. So I wrote intriguing, so maybe a little bit suspenseful. Then I thought it seemed really boastful at times. And then it shifts at that end to bleak, like just really bleak and hopeless. Um, and I, and I talk later about a shift too. Yeah. So when you start to notice that there's different tones and that they conflict a little, we're starting to see that there's depth and that there's maybe some complexity that we can talk about. So now we're edging a little bit more into some of these more complicated questions. So the next one I said is, who's talking and why are they talking? Um, and with Ozymandias, this is an interesting question. Um, I don't know if you've given much thought to the speaker, but it's always really intrigued me that I know nothing about the speaker at all. Well, um, I mean, it's funny, though, too, because we've got the frame narrative here. Like my kids, my kids. So what I forgot to mention, one of the problems that my kids actually come up with a lot is the idea that the the speaker and the poet are the same. Mm -hmm. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We we cannot yeah. assume that. Uh, we can't even assume that they're the same gender um, right. a lot of the times, you know. Um, so unless unless we have indicators of that, we just say the speaker, you know. Exactly. Um, and then all of a sudden we've got the speaker who's like, oh, by the way, I met this other speaker and the other speaker told me this. Right. And yeah, you're right. It's, it's that kind of extra separation. It's kind of, I mean, if if I'm going to judge him, I'm like, why? Like, I don't need this secondary speaker. There's really no point. But that's what led me to believe, is this some kind of symbol? Um, what could be the purpose? Because Percy's no idiot. He must have some kind of reason for it. Um, 
So I said, the speaker is very unknown. My traveler seemed maybe a little judgy, possibly bitter. I mean, the traveler seems to have a lot of feelings. Yeah, um, yeah. With the anonymous speaker, I kind of thought that maybe he stays super anonymous. We don't know his name. We don't even know the gender. We don't know anything about him. So that we have this sense of timelessness. So we don't get hung up on the speaker. And we care more about the story of this statue. Um that was the main interpretation that I got of the anonymous speaker. But it was the first thing that kind of caught me and made me go, hmm, I really don't know much about this speaker at all. Right. Um, so then the next question is looking for any kind of change. So I always call these shifts, but they could be called something else. Um, a shift could be in tone, in point of view, uh, style, structure, subject, topic, stuff like that. So um, you have several shifts in speaker, as we already talked about. Um, and then the major, major tone shift, and you even, I heard you doing it when you were reading it out loud. Um, when you get to Ozymandias, you know, look on my works, you might, it's just so proclaiming right. and boastful and proud. And then another beautiful shift as it just goes right into nothing beside remains. Right. And you got that enjambment right there where it's just like, yep, we quickly move by. Yep, we yep. saw it and on we move with our lives. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's just like kind of slaps you in the face because you're so built up like, ah, yeah. Oh wait. And you realize that maybe we're not praising this guy. Maybe things didn't work out how we thought. So um that shift in in tone, but also in kind of the speaker with when Ozymandias is proclaiming or you're reading the inscription on the statue, um, that's starting to build us into the meaning and the theme that I'm going to talk about later. Um, so then going back a little bit to tone, I said, what emotions drive the poem? Um, so the tone, if you want to go back and talk about it, I said inquisitive, maybe judgmental, boastful, a word that I use down here is, does the tone evolve or is it conflicted? Um, if we're going to get down into complication and then complexity, you're always going to be looking for how things change. Yeah. It's not just how it, things that are great don't start as one thing and stay one thing. Right. They're great because they evolve or they're complex and they have more than one thing. Um, so looking at that, that evolving tone um is where i kind of saw the major emotions driving the poem jump in if you need to stop me with any of this no, no, you're doing a great job because i mean this infographic right i mean i'm just driving the whole way through and i'm like okay mm -hmm. this is a perfect way to get kids to access the poem and you've already scaffolded the questions right so it's hey let's make sure that we start here and then we keep going here with that driving force of getting to the universal insight mm -hmm. or what a lot of other teachers call theme um, yeah. and, and so no, that's, that's why I'm not stopping you because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is money. You know, uh, another, another thing that my students struggle with, I think again, because we teach them so much poetic elements by the time they get to high school, it's like, mm, simile, metaphor, I am big pentameter. Right. But then if you go, well, why, what does it mean? They go, I don't know, you know, so I, I made sure to label poetic elements in here, but I don't want it to be driven by the poetic elements. I want it to be driven by seeking out a purpose and a message. And then where can we tie in poetic elements and analysis as we go? That's, I think, the strategy that works really well for me. Right. Um, so then I said, the best way to do like seeking poetic elements, I said, how is it complicated? Mm -hmm. um, where can you find figurative language, Sound or musical elements. Um, look again at the form. We talked about the diction a little bit, the style. So one uh, one thing that I noticed, other than the illusion, we already yeah. talked about, um, a tiny bit of parallel structure, some really great alliteration. There's boundless and bare. Um, there's another one with uh, lone and level. And there were a couple at the beginning too. And so maybe I would say, because this is supposed to be so driven by words that are spoken aloud, maybe that's why I have those musical elements to them. Yeah. Um, you know, think about doing this as a class, like having having kids actually read it out loud. Like I tell my students, whenever they whenever they have a poem, like I'm like, if you're not reading that in some sort of subtle voice, like that's mm -hmm. a problem. Because right. poetry is supposed to be such a sensory experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really, really important. Um, I, I do want to jump in just real quick, though, because... 
I want to talk about the form here, right? Form is often hard for kids to talk about. And, you know, this is a 14 line poem. So right off the bat, we're like, all right, there are 14 lines. What kind of sonnet are we going to label this? Uh, But it doesn't follow the traditional sonnet. And um, we had had spoken about this before. And I want to hear what your, you know, kind of mindset was about that. Because I was like, oh, wow, that's such an intriguing interpretation. That's completely valuable. Yeah. I I love talking about the form with Ozymandias because... So often I have students who are like, oh, it's a sonnet, oh, it's iambic pentameter, but then I, I kind of beat them down and say, well, why? Who cares? You know. But this is one where the form, by knowing that information, I think you can actually tie it to meaning because it is 14 lines. It starts out in a, a predictable form, a predictable rhyme scheme, a predictable pattern of meter. And then I think it's around line five or six, the rhyme scheme starts to fall off and the meter starts to fall off, and it kind of turns into a little bit of a mess by the by the second half of it. And again, Percy Shelley's no dummy, so this is probably on purpose. And if you look into the Romantic movement, it's all about like learning the classics, but then kind of breaking them down and creating something new. Right. And so he would certainly have studied the sonnet form, and he's saying it goes right along with the meaning of this poem. Listen, it doesn't have to last. I can right. break that down if I want to. And so he does in this classic poem that we teach every year. And he's got a broken sonnet form. And I think he's doing it on purpose. Right. And, you know, you still see that lasting form, but it's broken. Mm-hmm. And that's the same image that's being recounted by our speaker. It's a exactly. lasting form that's broken. Um, and, and you still get to see the remnants of it. But it's not in that full, authentic, original form. Right. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, because I know that a lot of times in my classroom, I don't I don't push form in terms of analysis, because a lot of times my kids, I need to get them to know the poem and, and the, the universal insights first. Right. But this is one of those ones where I think it's very easy to show a correlation between the form. Right. Uh, and that. another one that's really easy to do with form is um, the poem, A Story by Lee Young Lee. Yes. Um, and and that works out really well with teaching form and, and how this stands as age with the child or as the father projects into mm-hmm. the future and whatnot. But anyway, uh, back to this here, but I just great, great insights about how that relates to the image in the poem. And even let's pretend that Shelley did not mean that. Imagine putting that in an essay, though. That's sophisticated for a kid to bring that up with that correlation. And that's interpretive. So we want to encourage things like that. Right. It's always important to remember that it's not about what what the poet intended it's about the interpretation that you can make that you can also back up so if i mean my students get really hesitant because they're worried about being too bold and maybe it's wrong but i tell them if they can support it then they should be bold and they should make statements shelly's not coming back from the dead to to to, to criticize them so we're good yeah be open All right, so the next thing I said is, why does it matter? And this is where we're going to try and draw some theme or some meaning. Um, Maybe it's because I'm teaching Macbeth to my Shakespeare kids right now, but I really go into ambition and its corrupting nature and influence um, and talking about how, you know, Ramses, he built this this giant statue and it's got this boastful tag, like, remember me, look at my beautiful works. But it's ironically now standing in a ruined, deserted desert. Right. And in terms of your illusion, this is the same Ramses, most likely, that said, who is this God that I should listen to him, right? If, the, you know, according to the Exodus account. So now, like, that just echoes what's already known about who this is. And mm-hmm. he's also being referred to by his Greek name as opposed to his Egyptian name. So he's not even remembered as the Egyptian self, but the Greek version of it. Uh, right. Oh, oh, just beautiful. Anyway, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no, you're great. Um, so yeah, trying to get students to make those connections to what they've seen in literature, what they've seen um, in history, maybe in politics and in life. Um, we were talking about how it reminds me of, of Breaking Bad. And there's a really great video clip of Brian Cranston reading this poem with backdrops, just, just the backdrop, the setting of Breaking Bad behind him. Um, and it matches completely with that theme of, of an anti-hero who gets corrupted by power and that kind of thing. So, and students love those kinds of stories. They love anti-heroes and they love corruption of power. So <laughs> that's because they think that it can't happen to them, right? They're like, you know, this doesn't happen to me. And it's like, I mean, you just if got history taught us office. anything. <laughs> yeah, because they're popular. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a step that really 
I need to hit harder with my own students. Uh, I was noticing when I was reading some essays today that they hear me say juxtaposition and they think that I'm just trying to use fancy words. So I also call it contrast. But it's really great to try and get you right before you get into analysis mode and writing a thesis is just to think about what contrast could I point out? What do I see that's really interesting, kind of complex? Um, and I said that you have this boastful immortality of Ramsey's statue yeah. versus the colossal wreck that it is now. Like what a what a great contrast that is. That's the central image of this poem. And so then you can start to tie it back to our meaning about the rise and the fall of basically everyone. Yeah. Um, and now we've got this universal truth behind it too. Um, so then the last thing that I said, where am I? Right here. On the well, I think I might have skipped a couple. It's not working for me. Well, that's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was. Okay. Um, so I said, what makes it special or groundbreaking? Um, so go back to your writing prompt, go back to uh, everything that you've kind of done along the way. And then what can you say that's complex, that's interesting, and you know, you don't have to make it that poetic and beautiful of a statement. Um, but what I said is that history might remember you, but it might not remember you as you want it to. Um, and so then if, I, if that's my main claim that I'm gonna use to drive my essay, I can fall back on all the things along this infographic that I've taken notes on to help me support that main claim. And I think that would end up being a very strong analysis. I mean, think about even when you were talking about the nameless speaker and then mm -hmm. the nameless traveler, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the person and in the interactions obviously remembered, but the name's not even remembered, you know? And so you could totally even just tie that element into right. that kind of thematic uh, that thematic statement there mm -hmm. as well. So um, this right here, once again, is an infographic that we're going to post a link to in the description right down below. It looks absolutely gorgeous, as does everything that typically comes out of AP Lit and more. So, uh, you know, Gina, I really appreciate you making that and, and um, allowing this to kind of be here. Um, you know, it's one of those things I'm like, that looks like a good poster for the wall. Let's be real, um, because this helps get, guide those kids all the way through. Yeah. And also what's really nice about it for you, but not for me, is it makes me look bad because I just have my Google Doc here, which goes through my steps. Um, however, I will admit, I'll pull it up right now. I did put it into a Google slide as well uh, without examples, just as steps here uh, about ways to engage with poetry. Um, now, interestingly enough, though, um, I'm going to sh uh, showcase my screen here um, and we'll look at my steps. But, you know, we're going to try to deal with similar problems, but... Uh, we'll notice that, you know, um, Gina and I have different approaches to this, but they do overlap. And that's mm -hmm. what's going to actually really help us here. All right. So I've got my Google Doc um, that is linked down below um, and the PowerPoint will be there, too. Please note the PowerPoint just goes over the same steps with the Google Doc, but it does not have examples. Um, so I do contextualize my problems here with students. And in order for me to get them to access the poem, I have to, once again, get them to actually understand what's going on. And this is a great poem, once again, to, to get there because it is on the simpler side in terms of that narrative element there. But I, I let my kids, and I, and I never let them use run-on sentences except for with poetry for the very first step of what I asked them to do. And that is, for each stanza of a poem that they see, they have to use one long sentence to summarize what's going on in the sentence. And that at least lets me know that they are trying to access the poem on its literal level so that we can then start jumping through the literal to the figurative. Because uh, we do have to get there. But like I said, my problem is the kids just want to jump right in the deep end. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We have to swim into the deep end. Um, and but so that kind of helps them conceptualize all the abstract thoughts and then... By writing it out in one big free sentence, it's easier to pare it down later and take those steps back. That's right. I like that idea. Yeah, and the other cool thing about it too with that long sentence per stanza is that it forces them to see the shifts without me actually <laughs> telling them they're looking for shifts because they're like, right. oh, and then this, and then this, and then this. So after they summarize the whole thing, um, I make them identify the point of view of the speaker. So uh, in this case with Ozymandias, they're going to say it's a first person point of view. But then I'm going to have some kids that are like, yeah, but it's told by two different speakers. And then I'm going to have another kid that's going to be like, no, 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 it's three. And mm -hmm. I'll ask, 
whoa, whoa, whoa. It was it one, two, or three? And the argument will typically come with when the speaker reads the platform under the bottom, and they'll say that's the perspective of of Ozymandias. So because of that, they're like, that's the third speaker. And now I'm gonna I will get into the idea of frame narrative with them later. I just want them thinking about the point of view so that I know that they realize that they're thinking about it. Like, so mm -hmm. because they have these steps, they now know they have to always think about point of view because later on for more advanced analysis, they're going to have to ask the question, what do I know with this point of view? But what do I have access to that I wouldn't have if I had a different point of view? Right. Or they have to ask the opposite question. What don't I have access to now that I have this particular point of view? So uh, that's, I'm going to get them there. But once again, this is for me, how do I get them to interact here to then move them there? Um, next, um, exactly what you brought up. Let's be real. Good poets give a shift, right? Shift happens, all that kind of stuff. Um, the Garden of English is going to have a, a poster for that soon enough uh, just because it's something that kids have to know. But I do always label shift and contrast together because that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and actually on my PowerPoint, um, on my shift uh, page, I think I actually put, uh, if I remember correctly, let's see um, if I have it here. I think I actually, oh yeah, I actually have a shift happen slide, which says here are things <laughs> that kids can look at. Um, here are, you know, things that they can actually look for besides just words, you know, images right. and whatnot as well. Um and then what I make them do, though, is that when they find their contrast or their shifts, I actually make them write them out. Um, and I give them the template. Like for me, a lot of sentence frames really help my kids guide where they're going. And I want them once again to access the literal first. So you'll notice that I'm the difference that we have is you always go literal, then the figurative of that literal or the meaning. Then you go back to the literal mm -hmm. and then you, you always tie it. For me, I have to do all the literal first, and then I can move to the figurative. Yeah. Um, and those are just two different ways. That's why mm -hmm. we're doing this, right? Two different ways to approach effective poetry teaching in the classroom. Um, and you'll notice that I have one example here, you know, from lines one to two, the speaker shifts from narrating his own interaction with the traveler to exposing what the traveler recounted, right? And so now yeah. the kids are like, well, there's a shift here, so it's probably going to be important. And I'm like, good, we'll talk about why a little bit later. I'm glad you noticed it. But we also have a frame for contrasts as well. From lines four to nine to lines nine, uh, 12 through 14, the traveler contrasts the ability of the artist works survival over time. Uh, sorry, the ability of the artist works to survive over time is what it should say, to survive. Luckily we can edit this document on the spot. To survive over time with Ozymandias' lack of current kingdom. And so now notice that my universal insight is going to look more at the staying power of art mm -hmm. over uh, the kingdom itself. And that's, you know, one of those romantic ideals that we know, uh, that power of art over this tyrannical mindset here. Um, and so that's what I'm having my kids do. Look for those contrast moments, but they also have to tie it to lines. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's how it, it'll, it'll work there. And, it's, and the last one is, um, sorry, the next step is to identify the sensual language. This is the imagery that you brought up, right? Notice that I'm not connecting it to meaning yet. Um, and you really focused on this when you talked about the figurative language up front and the idea that we don't have tons of sensual imagery. We have some alliteration, and but the image that is, is the focus is indeed the colossal wreck. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I really want my students to focus on that image of the colossal wreck but also the image that's ascribed to the to the head that's broken off um, that shows that the artist was able to accurately capture this ruler uh, because that's the focusing on those physical qualities shows the power of the artist over Ozymandias because right. what's actually still lasting the the power I mean the the art itself which shows that the artist was had the skill to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's the much greater skill than just being able to rule a kingdom when it becomes desolate after. And my students sometimes feel, I see them panicking when they get a poem that's deceptively simple, like Ozymandias, and they, they feel like they need a slew of poetic elements to talk yeah. about. But I think that because 
you are not overloaded with so many things. You're able to dive deeper into, well, why is there so much imagery? Why yeah. is it keep talking about the look of this person? And that can help you get to that deeper meaning better. Yeah. So that's another way that this is a really good introductory poem in that sense. Right. And, you know, th like getting kids comfortable with poetry, but something that they can actually access first is so important. Like I actually start with how bad can I be from the Lorax? And then I move into, <laughs> then I move into this. Yeah. Um, but uh, the next step in what I do is this is where we start bridging to the to the abstract. Mm -hmm. And I make them chronologically review the poem and then list out singular abstractions that relate to each movement of the poem that they found. So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, in single words, navigate single words that are ideas, navigate the poem for me. And so they'll start because it talks about the ancient or the antique ruin, right? So mm -hmm. time. And then it's it's in ruins. You know, I saw the two legs with the broken body, so decay. Then he talks about the artist and what the artist could convey. So we've got art, and only that art has survived, survival. And then we have Ozymandias' lines, arrogance, and mm -hmm. that arrogance comes from his desire for power. And then the, the final setting there is kind of desolate, and all of this is this kind of recounting of things in the past, and therefore we see history. So I have <laughs> the poem... But now the poem is actually articulated in singular abstractions. So my kids are now ready to start saying, okay, when I write about this, when I start at the beginning, I need to make a comment about time. When I write about this next part, I need to make a comment about art and decay and survival. And then they know what ideas they have to correlate in their paragraphs as they write through the poem as we start shifting to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing that they have to do is they have to write a universal insight for the poem that follows this actual template. So I don't let my kids say you statements. Uh, I don't let my kids use idioms either because a lot of times they're like, you should never drink milk on Tuesday. Or like if I talk about the little boy who cried wolf, they're like, you shouldn't lie. And I'm like, what if we said the little boy who cried wolf illustrates that dishonesty? Like they have to put the idea there first. Mm -hmm. And when they create this insight, they're going to choose one of these words and then they're going to connect it to another one of these words in here. To, and I, we say, all right, what's our universal interpretation here? And here's just our example. Percy Shelley writes Ozymandias in order to illustrate that art has a greater ability to withstand the passing of time than even the mightiest of rulers and kingdoms. And, you know, think about the romantic ideal. If I teach the romantic ideal with Shelley at this time, and that's noticed too, though, a very different, universal insight than what you had talked about just a few minutes ago. And that's important because of course the AP, the AP lit rubric. That, yeah. That idea of interpretation. Right. And that's it's, also like, if I have a lot of teachers who will struggle with the concept of that line of reasoning. Yeah. Um, and that's just, you know, you've got art. Okay. I'm really going to talk about art. Talk about art at the beginning, connect it with art all the way throughout. Make sure you're still talking about that art at the end. And then you've got that line of reasoning all running right. through Yep. Right. And you can put that right in your poem. And mm -hmm. so that's what I want my kids to be able to do on the base level. And that's what I have to go through for the majority of poems that I first teach. Like, here's your process. And if we can figure out this, then we're going to actually be okay. Yeah. However, right, when we want to get into more advanced analysis, that's when I start asking the greater why questions. Um, and so I'll introduce these as my kids are ready for it. But this is like, poem four, poem five, not yeah. poem one. Right. Um, well, particularly, you know how I asked them to identify the point of view? Well, I already mentioned this a little bit, but I'll make them then go and ask, what am I able to receive that I normally couldn't if, I d if this were narrated in third person? Mm -hmm. And then vice versa, what am I not able to receive? Because this wasn't narrated in first person, I mean, in third person. And mm -hmm. so now the kids are really trying to think of what would the purpose of this first person narration right. be? Um, and then that's forcing them to make interpretive jumps. And then we say, is that justifiable with the text or not? Um, and, you know, in this case, we have the frame narrative and the frame narrative, the effect of a frame narrative is always one of two things. One, it's going to bring you some exposition that's going to allow things to make way more sense, or it might even be the full narrative, like in this poem. Uh, or, or should I say, and or, it's going to create a greater degree of separation. And so now the kids have to ask, okay, what's the purpose of creating a separation? 
and what's the background that I can now know. And you're going to notice, right, that, well, what's the frame narrative reveal in terms of ex exposition? This speaker was impacted by what that traveler said. So we're like, wow, this moment where this traveler has no name, like you had mentioned earlier, is still impactful. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Ozymandias, there's some element of impact now, even though it's not what he thought it was. Right. But the next one is, what's the greater degree of separation? Think about the central image of this whole poem. The whole image itself is separated. And now we say the separated perspectives mimic the actual separated structure of the archaic ruins itself. And that actually relates directly to the sentence structure because you'll notice throughout, you see a lot of that sejura, those mm -hmm. interrupted structures, very similar to the interrupted sonnet structure. And all of this goes back to show this kind of broken construct throughout. Yeah. And that goes right back to the point of view, a broken construct right away. Right. Um, and But we have to get kids to think about these things and we have to give them questions to do so. And that's that's where we go. But I don't expect my kids to get this the first time they read it. Right. Of course. Well, and yeah. part of it is just about asking asking the question of why they chose this. And if they're like, well, I don't know, then I tell them, simplify it. Yeah. Um, and like, what if he's, he didn't have the stage or what if it was straightforward? They'd be like, oh, well, that wouldn't sound right. Well, why? And right. then it's some kind of, like on my infographic all the way back, step two, I said, why would the speaker why the speaker would be figurative when they can be literal. It's not just because he's a poet. There must be some reason behind it. So if you don't know why, just ask, but like, simplify it first and then see what you're missing, what it you know, loses when you simplify it or make it straightforward. Right. And one quick tip for that is instead of asking questions like how and why, turn those questions into what questions because mm -hmm. answering what is way easier. When yeah. someone says, what's my favorite thing to do and I'm like snowboard, Right. That's easy. But when people yeah. say why, I have to actually be like, why do I love snowboarding so much? I've yeah. been on the same mountain my whole life and I'm 34 and I still will go down the same trails, same trails and love it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so the turning it into a what simplifies, but it can still get them to that. Why? Like it right. says, what is the purpose of creating the greater degree of separation? We're really asking why is there yeah. a greater degree? But we're putting it in those what forms. And that's just a quick right. little you know, way to help, too. And then the last thing, um, or should I say, there are two more things that I do. One of them is, is building on the shift and contrast templates. I make them go back and write the words in order to at the end of that, because that will then create them, uh, create for them the why. Yep. And now that we've got... them move past summary. I was, I was thinking like, we just got to make sure we explain why and then right. your summary. Right. And so now though, they've got these really cool topic sentences for their mm -hmm. paragraphs when they say something like, from lines four to nine to 12 to four, the traveler contrasts the ability of the artist's work to, uh, once again, it should say to survive, typo again, that's okay. Uh, works, um, I should say work to survive over time with Ozymandias' lack of current kingdom in order to illustrate that art has a greater ability to withstand the passing of time than even the mightiest of rulers and kingdoms. And sure enough, I that's, that's a great universal statement. And it's like, this kid gets it. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to question it. This kid gets it. Right. Um, and then the last thing I always draw kids' attention to is the use of sejura and enjambment. And when I do that, I always say, you know, sejura forces you to slow down. So you need to figure out why am I slowing down here? Why am I breaking things up a bit? How does that relate to what's going on in the poem? And in this case, once again, it, it's, related to that focal image and then the enjambment why do i have to speed up and when you you know you see the enjambment in particular in this poem in the last few lines when it's like and nothing else remains just the desert right and it's the same exact thing why do we want to speed up because we speed past this guy now we don't mm -hmm. stop and say look at his mighty works we're like we know we existed and on we go with our lives and yeah. time does the same thing time does not slow down and we see that the enjambment's at that same moment where we get that meaning. And yeah. um, so that's how that's how I get my kids to approach poetry with these questions. And these are the same ones every time. You can tie it to any poem. Mm -hmm. um, and this helps get that critical thinking in. So uh, for you viewers out there, you've got two ways to access poetry here. Um, Gina, I am so grateful that you were willing to spend your time on the Garden of English um, and technical difficulties aside that we'll deal with. And, um, you know, I really appreciate what you were doing here. 
Um, so uh, I want to encourage everybody to actually go check out uh, Gina's Teacher Pay Teacher Store. Once again, the infographic is a free post on that already. That'll be linked right down below. Um, for uh, the Garden of English itself, um, you can access what we have down below as well. We've got some Ozymandias prompts um, on our website in our Teacher Pay Teacher Store as well. Uh, the easiest way that you can all help the Garden of English is just by clicking subscribe to this, especially if this video was helpful to you because we want to give you more opportunities to meet other people um, and talk about ways to do things. And if Gina's willing, I'm more than happy, I'm more than willing to get her back on here to share other awesome things that she does if you go to her Absolutely. site. Absolutely. great stuff. Um, so thank you again for your time. The Garden of English is uh, active on Instagram and Facebook, uh, so you can follow us there. Uh, we're pushing our Patreon elements so we can continue to um, get better content. And uh, Gina, what do you have for social media where people can work with you? I've got Instagram and Facebook. I'm better on Instagram, I'll be honest. But it's AP Live and More, all one word, type out the word and. Um, and then also, one little plug for my website, Teachers Pay Teachers is monetized with a website. I put so much stuff on there that's free. Uh, I've been going through lessons, free lessons every week that break down the AP Lit skill standards. So if you're an AP Lit teacher, but I have a lot for English teachers in general too. So um, feel free to go there for plenty of other stuff that's free. Great. Excellent. So plenty of free resources around between you and me. If you want to support with monetary elements, you can, uh, but don't feel like we're forcing you to do that. That is not our goal here. Uh, we're here to help. And so because of that, we want to make sure that we see you next time. So have a great day. Oh, yeah.